morning, everyone. I'm really excited to see uh, a full house here this morning. We weren't sure how many people would show up. This is a brand new uh, seminar that we're doing for the first time, a benefits, for team, benefits protection team leadership workshop. And uh, I'm Joy Elam. I'm the National Legislative Director here for DAV. And our, thank you. <laughs> and our, our special guest here with us today is our former National Legislative Director, who I know all of you know, Joe Violante. <laughs> excited to be able to, um, uh, that Mark was um, able to fit this seminar into our busy schedule this time for convention, but we thought it was so important. As you know, we're trying to reconstitute our benefits protection team, our grassroots advocacy, and we realized in, uh, when we go out to conventions and we talk to a lot of you, that a lot of people just didn't, not, not, weren't sure what they should be doing, and we know we have a lot of new people in DAV that are just coming in. And we wanted to make sure that you really know what the duties and responsibilities are if you're chosen or appointed as a benefits protection team leader in your department or your state uh, chapter. So this seminar will be focused on, uh, we've developed a new toolkit and Joe is going to be going through the toolkit um, with all the different sections. Uh, we've got some handouts for you and I see we, run it, we ran out. Um, we will have additional copies that we'll make um, available up in the um, resolutions coordinating the office if you want to stand by, stop up, or we will, um, uh, they're all going to be posted on DAV's web website as part of the a virtual handout from the convention. So they're available there as well when you go home if, you'd rather, if you don't need the hard copy right now. But the goal of this seminar really is just to um, first give you an overview of, of the toolkit that we developed and also then um, give you an opportunity to hopefully at the end we'll have some time for questions and we might invite a couple of our interim legislative committee members to share with you what they're doing in their departments because we see a couple of people that are really doing it right. They've really got a hold of how they're um, handling their grassroots, and we're going to need it more than ever in the future. I mean, this is the real, that's why I'm so glad that we have the full house here, because we're going to need everybody in DAV to really work together, um, you know, forward, uh, going forward to protect our benefits and um, protect our health care system. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Joe's got the PowerPoint and the floor, so I'll let him make opening remarks. Thank you, Joy. A couple of, uh, everyone hear me okay? A couple of housekeeping things. I, I just like to see a show of hands for those individuals that have been appointed their department benefit protection team leader. Can you raise your hands, please? Yeah. Great. How about chapter benefit protection team leaders? Any of you here? Okay, this, this will be a, applicable to you too. Um, but I'll be talking mostly about departments, but the same thing um, is true on the chapter level. As, as Joy mentioned, you know, we, we've had this program before, and unfortunately, um, we allowed it to, we, by we, I mean me, fall through the cracks. I don't think we gave the departments and our benefit protection team leaders at the time enough information on what was expected of them and how to do their, their job. So that's what we're doing this time around, is making sure that everybody understands the program, how it's run, and what's expected of you. So this is a program about our benefit protection team leaders. Those are the individuals back at the department or, or chapter level who we're going to be relying on to get our word out. As I mentioned, um, we had this program before but we're trying to do it now so that we can take it to a new level so that DAV can speak with a consistent voice across the country to make sure that members of Congress and, and individuals in the administration know who we are, what we want, and what disabled veterans need and their families also. You know, the threats are real. And you've heard probably between uh, the secretary and the chairman of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, some of those 
threats that are out there. You know, VA health care is at a, a critical point right now. And there are some people that want you to believe the choice is the way to go, that we can give veterans the money and, and let that money follow the veteran where they want. That's not true. It's, it can't happen that way. There are 9 million veterans enrolled for VA health care, 6 million who use the system. You can't allow that many people to just choose where they want to go and think you're going to have the funding necessary to pay for that care. It's not going to happen. And those people that want to use VA and need to use VA are not going to have a choice. So there's a threat to health care. You know, we've seen a threat, again, to rounding down our cost of living COLA. Um, it may not seem like, like a lot of money, but over decades it adds up. I mean, considering it's you know tens of millions of dollars that the government will save annually by round, rounding down our COLAs, uh, it has an impact on disabled veterans. And also, you know, there's been a lot of talk about eliminating individual unemployability for veterans over the age of 65. Uh, for some reason, members of Congress have it in their minds that. You know, any veteran who, once they turn age 65, can walk into VA, get individual unemployability, because they don't want to work anymore, they're retired, and they just don't understand the system and how hard it is for those individuals who want to continue to work, but because of their service-connected disabilities, they can't. And, you know, it's up to us to make them understand that this is not a welfare program, it's not a handout that there are individuals that probably need to work beyond the say, age of 65 or want to work beyond the age of 65 and can't because of their service-connected disabilities and this program needs to remain viable. So you know, those are just a few of the threats that are out there. So what we're trying to do is to work smarter. You, know, you don't hear Congress trying to, to, to round down COLAs for Social Security recipients, because they know what would happen. They'd be hearing from 50 million people who are on Social Security that that's not the way to go. So they don't touch that rail, and that's where we want to be. We want to be in a situation where when we tell members of Congress, this is a good idea or this is a bad idea, they pay attention to what we have to say. So what we've put together, as Joy mentioned, are the tools that you're going to need to do your job so that we speak with a single voice. And we've put together a toolkit for you, and I'll be, I'll be talking about it in detail. And these tools can also be used at the state level. You know, a lot of times you pass resolutions dealing with property taxes for local veterans, or maybe you know eliminating um, license fees for hunting licenses or driving licenses. Um, those are issues that are local issues, and these same tools can be used on the state or local level to get the job done. The duties, you know, basically it's, it's pretty simple. As a benefit protection team leader, your responsibilities are for coordinating and overseeing. DAV's legislative agenda, including the resolutions process, which we'll talk about in, in more detail, and grassroots efforts. And you're also, at, again, at the discretion of your department commander, um, responsible for advocating on the local level uh, with regards to resolutions that were adopted uh, by the um, department. <coughs> Now, the nice thing is that all the time that the benefit protection team leader spends on these areas will be covered under LVAP. So you'll be able to report your time under the LVAP program, the Local Veterans Assistance Program, and get credit for the time that you spend in uh, taking care of uh, the legislative and, and grassroots process. You should have a copy of your um, duties that are handed out. They're enumerated uh, here 
You can also find them on the website. I'm not going to go over them uh, right now, but it, it gives you an idea of what's expected of you and what you need to do. And Joe, I would just mention on that, one of the most critical, important things you can do to get your information up to date is um, joining the Commander's Action Network. And I just helped one of our members right here just sign up for it. She wasn't aware about it. What is that? It's our alert system for our grassroots. So if you go into a DAV's website, how can you help? Select Advocate. That'll take you to the legislative portion of our website. And under there, there's a section that you can just click on to join our Commander's Action Network. What we do in our office in D.C. is put together alerts so when something comes up, for example, a bill is coming up on the floor and this bill is going to um, you know, be paid for, it's a great benefit, but it's going to be paid for by our um, rounding down our COLAs for the next 10 years. We need you to take action now. And then you go to take action and what, um, it pull, you put your zip code in, it pulls up your your two senators, your representative, and you're able to do a, um, a letter right there. We, we provide a letter for you. I see we have a question in the back, but. Good morning, Joy. Joy. Um, I take it a step forward. I, I do that. I send it out to the senators and the congressmen, but then I share that on Facebook so that Great people honey. in my friend network see that, and veterans and non-veterans um, a family member can then share that with them and it rolls right. you know, like dominoes. And that's what Joe will be talking yes. about in more detail. But the Commander's Action Network, if you do one thing after convention, if you haven't signed up for that, do that one right away. One thing I forgot to mention as part of the housekeeping, if you have a question, please ask it while we're going through the presentation while it's still fresh in your mind. Um, there's a mic over here if you don't have a, a loud voice. And, uh, you know, please uh, feel free to ask your questions when they come up. The key, the cornerstone to the toolkit is DAV's legislative process in you. Many of you may have seen it. It's been updated uh, to now include some of the social media um, that, that some of us are using. Uh, not all of us, but some of us. And so we, we've updated it so that it includes social media. You know, in the past, um, in there we talked about, um, you know, phone calls and letter writing and um, telegrams. Uh, you know, those things, not so much anymore. But so it's, it's been updated and it's, it's there for you. It, it covers a lot of different things. Our resolutions process. And again, as a benefit protection team leader, we're looking to you to oversee the resolutions process back there in your departments and chapters. Resolutions are important, and we'll, we'll find out more about that here in a minute. Um, also, the, uh, it talks about the legislative process, how a bill becomes a law, you know, how they get introduced, what part our resolutions uh, play in that. And it also talks about our advocacy campaign, how to conduct an advocacy campaign. And finally, it talks about we're nonpartisan, and it's important to remember that, especially in a year like this when we have presidential elections and um, you know all the House and a third of the Senate up for re-election, a lot of people get involved, and as an individual, it's your, it's your right as an American citizen, and, and you earn that right as a disabled veteran to get involved in that process, but you have to do it as an individual and be careful not to make the statement, you know, DAV supports this candidate, that candidate, because we can't, or even to imply it by wearing, you know, a DAV cap. Sometimes people see that and they associate the organization uh, with the process and so we just have to be careful about so we, that. we put a do's and don'ts for election year along with DAV's national policies on the back so that's just a really good reminder resolutions I said it's covered in the legislative process and you um, they're important because they mandate the action 
of the organization and its members. It, you know, we, it tells us the do's and don'ts of what we need to be you know, supporting or opposing. Under the National uh, Constitution, Article 2, it states our purpose, and that purpose is to advance the interests and work for the betterment of all wounded, gassed, injured, and disabled veterans. That's our purpose. That's what we're all about. That's why we exist. Under our national bylaws, Article 2, Section 2.1, Participating in political issues which have a direct bearing upon the welfare of America's disabled veterans. That again is what we're about. Yes, ma'am. Where did you say you put the do's and There should be a handout. If you didn't get one, we'll make more copies. Is but it a separate handout? It's a, this is a single sheet. It says do's and don'ts for an election year. So we'll make we'll get some more copies for you. You said you'll make them available. Yeah, we'll, we'll, in room 222 yeah. two, two, on the second floor in the resolutions uh, room. Article 2.2, .2, paragraph 1. No member shall appear before any legislative body or speak in the name of the organization propounding a position contrary to any re resolution then in effect. So, we don't have a resolution on an issue. You can't be out there saying the organization supports it. You have to be careful. The legislative staff does the same thing when they're asked to testify on legislation. The first thing they do is they look at a resolutions book to see if we have a resolution on the issue and what that resolution says. As members, again, you know, you're prohibited. Uh, from doing anything that uh, is contrary to a DAV resolution. As a member identified with the DAV, as an individual, again, you have your rights. Section 2.2, .2, paragraph 2. No federal le legislation shall be sponsored or endorsed in the name of the DAV unless it has been approved by the adoption of a resolution. Again, the same thing. Um, we can't support something that we don't have a resolution on. There are a couple of exceptions, and, and they'll be coming up here in a minute, but we need to ensure that we have a resolution that allows us to support or oppose a particular issue. Under paragraph three, we find those exceptions, and they are any attempt to repeal or deprive disabled veterans or their dependents of benefits already provided by law or regulation. So in other words, we may not have a resolution that says we would oppose any uh, legislation or regulation that would take away individual unemployability for veterans over the age of 65. We don't need a specific resolution on that issue because this exception in our bylaws gives us the authority to oppose that because they're taking something away. And the other part of that exception is that when our national leadership, the commander, the national adjutant, or the executive committee deem support of legislation to be beneficial to disabled vets, and again, um, if we don't have a resolution on a particular issue, but the leadership of the national organization deems that that legislation is important to the benefit of disabled vets, they can allow us to support it. It's, you know, you've got to be careful about that because there's a lot of legislation that sounds like it's beneficial, uh, but when you scratch down to the essentials of it, you realize that it's not reasonable or that it puts us in a, in a very untenable situation trying to support it. So, you know, it's, it's rare uh, that we find legislation that we don't have a resolution on that uh, is beneficial to disabled vets or their families. But we do have those two exceptions. A resolution process. Now, it's important that you understand about the 
process itself and how it works and you know, familiarize yourself with it because again, we're gonna be, the staff will be relying on you back there in your departments and your chapters to oversee that process. Normally, resolutions uh, can be introduced by an individual at the chapter level. Anyone can introduce a, a resolution at the chapter level and then it comes before the chapter for consideration. Or, you know, benefit protection team, chapter benefit protection team leader, or maybe if you have a chapter resolutions committee, they can propose a resolution at a chapter meeting. Yes? Joe, uh, how do we learn the proper way to write up a resolution and how it should look when we submit it? It's in the document, the legislative process in you, and we'll cover that in a minute too, quickly, but in there it goes into detail about, again, what our purpose is and, you know, keeping those resolutions on, on what's pertinent to us and then how to, how to write it, you know, title, a whereas clauses, what goes in there, we the have resolution. A, and we have a webinar, too, that Adrian um, taped that's available as well as taking you through the steps of drafting a resolution. So should it be prepared like that at the chapter level before it's presented to the department, or is that to be drafted at the department level before we submit it to the legislation in Washington? You know, it's always good for the maker of the resolution to have their thoughts in there so you know exactly what it is they want to accomplish. But again, and, and we'll cover that here in a second, um, you can at the department level. Once a, once a resolution is introduced and passed by the chapter, it goes up to the department. Now, at the department level, an individual um, can also introduce a resolution at that level and be voted on. So if you're a chapter member and you don't feel comfortable writing a resolution, you can always take it to the department at their meeting and get some assistance in you know, having it written up properly. And then as long as the department passes that resolution, then it will come up to the national. And, and again, you know, at the department level, if it's a chapter resolution, it will be voted on. It, it can also be introduced at the department level by an individual or by your department um, uh, legislative committee or resolutions committee, whatever you, whatever you have. Once that resolution is passed by the department, and keep in mind too, all national wants are resolutions dealing with national issues. You know, at, at the national level, we're not interested in, you know, the, the state of A wanting to exempt uh, disabled vets from property tax. That's, that's a great, it's a great thing, but it has nothing to do on the national level. So keep that at the department level and work on it at the department level. Don't send it in with all the other resolutions um, after your convention that deal with national issues. Keep those resolutions local and, and work on them there. Now again, even at the national level, um, other than those resolutions that have been approved by departments that come in and go to the resolutions coordinating um, office, there, there can be resolutions introduced. Our NEC, if you were at the first meeting, saw them approve you know, resolution 001, which is our statement of policy. So the National Executive Committee at national convention, um, or at midwinter, or any time, can introduce a resolution and have it voted on. Um, also, at the convention, there's convention committees and during those convention committees, resolutions can be introduced and adopted at that point. And I see a lot of them, um, particularly in general resolutions, you know, thanking the hotel, thanking the VA, and then a resolution um, commending the, the national commander for the job that they did uh, during uh, their tenure. Was there a question in the back? No? Oh, no, I was just saying, if there is a question, from the audience, could you please repeat it so that we in the back can understand what we're talking about? And again, it's important. Learn the process. Understand it. The other thing you need to do is educate 
our members who are going to be coming to national convention and who want to be on a convention committee, let them know about the process. I mean, we don't have a lot of time, um, and 70 to 80 percent of our resolutions are long-standing resolutions that are currently in our, our legislative program book or on our website. You know, have them familiarize themselves with the resolutions, understand the resolutions, and then when they come and they're on the convention committees as a delegate from your district, they have an idea of what these resolutions are all about. And you know, a lot of times you get a lot of questions and, and sometimes the resolution has been around for longer than I've been in the organization. And you, know, you, want, you want to be able to answer those questions, but you also want to be able to get through the process and get the discussion down to the important stuff. And us, us having the resolutions is so critical because, like Joe said, when we go up to testify on behalf of the organization, if a particular issue is really relevant that, that year about suicide prevention or, you know, mental health issues or whatever the case may be, we need to have a resolution. That's why we're trying to always think ahead. We encourage people to, you know, look through the book, which the resolutions, we, you know, usually need those from year to year so we can comment in a positive way um, for the organization on pending legislation that we're they're looking at. And as I mentioned earlier, in this toolkit, it talks about the construction of a resolution and goes into the, the various elements, elements of a resolution. First one being you need a title. You need to be concise and to the point and make it understandable so that by reading the title alone, you have a basic idea what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Whereas clauses, again, with the whereas clause, you need to be concise and to the point and you need to develop the justification for what we're trying to do. And the example here is on concurrent receipt. And it talks about the fact that veterans uh, rated below 50% don't receive their military retired pay and their VA disability compensation it goes into why that's not fair and so you have to build upon that build your justification for why it is um, that we need this resolution and what we're trying to accomplish and finally the resolve clause and again to the point and it tells us what it is we want to do in this particular case it's to support legislation to remove that inequity of concurrent receipt for those veterans rated uh, less than 50%. So all, it's all in there, goes into much more detail, explaining the do's and don'ts of writing resolutions, what we're looking for, and again, if you have questions, the legislative staff is there to answer those questions for you. First place I would look would be in the resolutions book or online at the resolutions. See, do we have a resolution on the issue? And then if you still have questions about why we don't, you can talk to the legislative staff and find out what it is, um, <coughs> what reason there, there may be for not having a resolution on that issue. The um, toolkit talks about the legislative process. You learn all about how a bill becomes a law. Um, in normal cases, they're introduced um, by a member of Congress. Sometimes you have uh, similar bills, what they call companion bills, introduced in the House and in the Senate. It's not necessary to have one introduced in each chamber. Sometimes, you know, we do it just so that you give both chambers, you know, the idea and they start thinking about it and start discussing it. But um, you know, in, in, in reality, all you need is one bill introduced in one chamber for it to get through uh, the committee process and approved and then out to the floor for a vote and then sent over to the um, other chamber. Again, the importance of our resolution process tells us, mandates to us, what we can support, what we must oppose, and what we, what we need to 
remain neutral. <clears throat> not all legislation impacts disabled veterans. Uh, not all legislation do we take a position on. Um, it may benefit uh, some other group of, of veterans, and as long as it doesn't hurt disabled veterans, their families and survivors, we can remain neutral on it. Now, if we do have a resolution, you can proactively go to your member of Congress and ask them to introduce legislation on the issue. Say there wasn't any legislation introduced on Space A available travel, and you wanted your member of Congress to introduce it. We have a resolution on that. You can take that resolution into them and encourage them to introduce a bill that would accomplish that goal. And would, we would therefore, since we have a resolution, be able to support it. So mm -hmm. if the bill isn't introduced by your member of Congress, as long as we have a resolution on the issue, you can take it in there and get your member of Congress to uh, introduce it. And again, as, as I mentioned, to be introduced in, in one chamber, passed, sent over to the other chamber, as long as it's passed in that chamber and there's no changes, it then goes on to the president, who has the option to either sign it um, or um, veto it. And that, is, again, is covered in much detail in the legislative process in you. We talk about grassroots campaign, and I love this picture because it gives you an understanding of how important our grassroots are. You know, I'll, I'll never forget testifying before the uh, Veterans Affairs Committee, and a pretty strong veterans advocate uh, said to the panel of, of veteran service organizations that were testifying, you know, I'm listening to you and you're telling me all your organizations think this legislation is important, but I'll be honest with you, I haven't heard from any of my constituents on this issue that uh, there's a, an issue involving homeschooling, and I've heard, you know, from hundreds of thousands of people on this issue. Clearly it's important to them. So, you know, it's, it's important that our grassroots take the time to get out there and make their elected officials know that these issues are important, and that's, you know, where you come in, and we'll discuss about developing a network. But normally, what will happen is legislative staff will make a decision on uh, what to send out, what to, to highlight uh, for our grassroots. You'll get a, uh, an email and an alert that uh, you'll be able to use. If you're a member of DAV CAN, you'll get that uh, same alert. Um, now we do have information on the benefit protection team leaders, their email addresses, and uh, we'll be able to also communicate uh, with you through that avenue. So you get the alert, sample letter, or an action plan. In some cases, um, you know, maybe requiring you to take some action immediately because there's going to be a vote. Yes, sir. I just have a question because I'm a paralegal by trade before I came to work with DAV. What's the turnaround time before a person introducing a bill like a resolution to the, uh, to the senator or congressman to be able to have them move forward on the floor with it? Do they have a specific turnaround time? Well, oh, I know. Uh, you know, it, it depends on the issue. It depends on the member. Um, in some cases, you know, they can do it quickly. In other cases, it languishes. Um, you know, I've, I've seen bills that have been introduced, that have gone through hearings, that have been approved uh, by the Veterans Affairs Committees, and then, you know, just don't come up for a vote for whatever reason. So it's just, it's just a hit and miss situation. Yes, ma'am. Rebecca Johnston, uh, Tennessee Chapter 22 in Columbia, Tennessee. As far as uh, coming up for a vote, something I recently learned in legislation, if you don't care, aggressively, if you're going to talk to a legislator, aggressively encourage them to co-sponsor a bill. Their legispeak, usually they'll say, uh, we're going to vote for you as soon as it comes up for a bill, knowing full well that it'll never come up for a bill. So 
you know, another way is, depending on the timing, or DAV meetings, whether it be your chapter meeting or your depart or department meeting, get the word out. Make sure if you receive a recent alert, an email, bring it to the meeting. You know, the, the woman in the back talked about putting it up on Facebook, and that's excellent to do. And part of what we encourage here in this document is, you know, to get that information out, to repost it or retweet it. Um, but another way is to, to bring that alert and that sample email letter into your meeting, chapter, or department, and you know, let those members know who may not be members of DAV CAN or don't have access to a computer, let them know what the issues are, give them a copy, and encourage them you know, to do a handwritten note if, if they don't have access to emails. And if, if some of you remember the time from the Benefits for Team workshop at uh, midwinter, we did, we had everybody write right during our seminar, a note, and I forget what it was on, particularly we needed, there was something that was we really- We handed it to, uh, at that during, time, Chairman Filner and Chairman Akaka during the commander's presentation. presentation. And that was very effective, because they they saw, you know, hundreds of, e or hundreds of actually handwritten letters on that particular issue. It was very effective. And, so it's important, you know, get get the word out. If you're going to send by snail mail uh, a letter to your member of Congress, do it to the district office. <coughs> you send it to their Washington office, it's going to be uh, radiated somewhere out in Maryland. In some cases, they overdo it, and all they get is an envelope full of ashes. So if you're handwriting it, send it to the district office. It's green. Center here is you, the benefit protection team leader, department, chapter. You're the, you're the cornerstone of this whole program. What you need to do is develop a network, and it should be a call network, an email network, social media network, whatever it is, this chart applies to all of them. But say this say we're calling in this particular instance, you need to have a call list, you get an important issue uh, that comes in that needs to be addressed immediately, all you need to do is make four calls. First call could be to your department commander. And again, you're encouraging that individual to then get the word out to the department leadership. Um, if you're doing an email, that, that first gray circle could be your first network, all your department uh, leadership, your department line officers. Second call or email uh, network or social media network could be your chapter benefit uh, protection team leader. So again, it's important that you let each of these individuals know that you expect them or assign them who they should be calling or emailing once you get the message out to them. So this chapter um, benefit protection team leader may have as part of their assignment, their chapter commander, and maybe three other uh, chapter benefit protection team leaders in, in the local area. And now you've got your third call or group of emails. Again, this one could be your second chapter benefit uh, protection team leader that you're reaching out to. Or, if it's an email, and you have your department leadership, the first one, the second one is your um, chapter benefit protection team leaders. This third one could be family and friends. And the fourth one, again, if it's a call, it's you know chapter uh, benefit protection team leader. Emails, social media, this could be you know your coworkers. And again, it's important that they understand that you get the message out to them, they in turn need to get the message out to their networks. And that's how you build a network of networks. And so now they make their four phone calls or send out to their networks. And you can see how your message <coughs> is now out there growing to the masses. And 
you know, if you're, if you're making four phone calls, you're, you're talking maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes at the most, and calling those four people, relaying the message for them. If you're sending an email on social media, you're talking five or 10 minutes. Um, but look at the number of people that you've gotten the word out to. So, what do you do now? You've gotten the word out, you've, you've received your alert from national uh, uh, legislative staff, you've contacted your people, what now? Looks like I'm way ahead of myself here. In the majority of cases, you've done your job. All you need to do is follow up. Make sure that those people that you gave the message to received it and have, have gotten the message out. In a, in a small number of cases, you're going to have to take it to the next level. And I understand what's going on with the Veterans First Act. This is probably going to be one of the first tests to see how well our benefit protection team program works. Because you're going to need to take that, I believe, to the next level, and that is personal contact with elected officials, phone calls. You need to call up the office. And again, in those situations where you may have your elected official not in support of this legislation or as part of a roadblock, let them know it's not acceptable, that this legislation is important. May require an office visit. You know, you can attend. A lot of times you'll get uh, little postcards or announcements from your elected officials that they're having a town hall meeting at such and such a location, such and such a time. Go and raise our issue. You know, because not only do you have the members' attention, but you have all those people in the audience that may not be aware of how important this piece of legislation is to disabled vets. So raise those issues. And you can, you can collaborate also with your other VSO partners. You know, we often do that um, collectively. We're working on something like this Veterans First Act that everybody supports. So if your department, you can also, in your, you talk with the American Legion or the VFW or the Paralyzed Veterans. Um, in your area, you can also say, as a VSO groups, we'd like to come in and meet and talk about this issue. Um, and, you know, if you're able to have the information that's needed, sometimes they, you know, okay. They'll, they'll meet with a group and talk, talk about the issue and what the, so you can find out what the problem is, but it might be the way to sway them and push it over. And we do have uh, information in this document on building these coalitions. And in many cases, you know, DAV on the local level is already part of a, a veterans coalition. In this document, we also have samples. In this particular case, these are sample letters inviting a member of Congress to a DAV business meeting or um, a DAV town hall meeting. You know, we can set up our own town hall meetings and uh, encourage members to come to that or a social event you know a lot of uh, chapters or departments uh, have social events uh, breakfasts or you know around memorial day or veterans day there's sample letters in here to to help you craft a letter to your elected officials inviting them to these events and also uh, candidates town hall meetings Yes, sir. I just wanted to bring up, I'm putting together a, a breakfast right now with Applebee's. They're doing any nonprofits uh, where they'll do a breakfast and they'll do everything. They give you the tickets, they do everything. They're looking for 100 people to show up and then they split it, um, I think 60, 40 or something like that. So just a note to everybody, Applebee's is doing those as well. Great. You know, we do, again, talk about having candidate town meeting, and this is an election year. You have uh, candidates out there that um, want to get their message out to us, and there's nothing wrong with DAV chapters and departments holding a town hall or a candidates town hall meeting. Get your candidates in there to talk about veterans' issues. There's a couple of caveats. Number one, make sure you invite all of the candidates. If you have two candidates or three candidates, 
make sure invitations go out to all of the candidates. Now, you, you, you know, sometimes you're not going to find individuals who are going to be up on who want to be up on stage together. Um, so try to try to be flexible. You may have to hold two town hall meetings, or maybe you bring in one candidate uh, to talk, and then they leave. The next candidate comes in and speaks. Um, they all don't have to agree to come as long as you've made a reasonable intent to get them there. Only one candidate shows up. We're not being partisan. You know, we've invited all the candidates. One chose to come. We want to hear what they have to say, what their message is. And again, it's not only listening to them, but it's letting them know what's important to us. And you'd be surprised um, how helpful that is when these individuals know what it is we want when they come to Washington. We also have a guideline in there for uh, successful congressional meetings. And we outline what you need to do to have a successful meeting. First thing is the schedule meeting time with your elected officials. And again, we have sample letters to help you do that. Um, you can um, you know, send the letter uh, to the local office, local district office. You can fax your letter, if you have the fax information, to their congressional office in D.C. requesting the meeting, depending on where you want to meet. Um, or you can, again, um, do it by email if you have a contact information there. We also talk about what you need to do to prepare for that meeting. And, you know, know the issue. I would not go in there with more, you know, than two or three issues. And if you can, you know, have just one issue, that's great. Uh, understand the issue, be prepared, and determine who's going to be the spokesperson, and maybe you as the benefit protection team leader, and maybe someone else um, in your group that you want to appoint as the uh, spokesperson, because maybe you know it's a congressional uh, office and you're not in that member's district, but John Jones is, and so it's a lot easier if you know the member knows that he's talking to one of his constituents. So understand the issue. Pick a spokesperson if you're going in as a group, and make sure you have a leave behind. And that is, you know, information as to what the issue is. And again, call on the legislative staff to help you uh, put that together. If, we, if they haven't sent something out, and normally you, know, you would have had a, an alert on the issue that is, is enough for you to leave behind. And for right now, we just um, did the update on DAV's key legislative priorities. It's a virtual handout. It's on the website. Um, it covers our key issues on fully developed appeals and appeals reform, caregivers, women veterans, and um, the update on the Commission on Care. And all of the information is sort of a one-pager, and then with the ask at the bottom with the bill numbers attached, so you get a little bit of information on the bill. It's an easy thing. You can print it out, able to bring that up to educate yourself, to have that discussion, and then as a leave behind for the staff member. Say again, it's called what, please? This is the update on DAV's key legislative priorities. It's from our um, Benefits Protection Team Workshop, and they should have posted all of the handouts from the convention are available on the website. I'm sorry. I don't have this one printed out, um, but I could. Uh, we can have some a, a few copies made if you need. If you need. If you don't have access to email, or can look it up on the web. Sure. And Paul, just let me know that we do have more handouts in the back of the room next to the water cooler. So when you leave, I think they went. They made extra copies. And so you'll, the handouts that we gave today will be available in the back. It's important also during the meeting to keep it short. You know, you don't want to take up too much time. You don't want to become a nuisance. Um, you don't want to argue with a member of Congress if they don't agree with your position or, or a staff member. Uh, be polite. 
um, again, leave behind the handout. And also mentioned in this guideline is what do you do after the meeting? You know, and what you need to do is send a thank you letter. Um, and we have three different examples in here. One, if you've met strictly with the member of Congress only, there's a sample letter, you know, in there, how to address it to, to that member of Congress. If you met with the member of Congress and staff, again, how to do that letter. Or if you just met with staff, you know, what you say uh, in that thank you letter. And it's also good once you've made that contact with staff, you know, keep going back, um, follow it up, and, you know, stay in touch with them. One other thing, too, um, that I failed to mention, during the meeting, you know, be ready to answer questions. And if you can't answer the question, let them know that someone from the legislative, national legislative staff will get back to them and then make sure you let the national legislative staff know what that question is. Don't you know, feel you have to answer all the questions. You, you may not know the answer. Don't try to fudge it, uh, but just let them know someone will be getting back to them. Yep. And our information, you know, um, will be available in the handout as well in terms of our, the names of our legislative staff and our number up in D.C. And you can call anytime, as Joe said. You have a question, a concern, somebody, you know, you went to their office, they asked you about a particular piece of legislation, or you, and that way you can either give them our number for their staff to follow up or have us, one of us, follow up with them. But that personal contact and being able to um, be able to get a meeting with your <coughs> member or their key staff person um, is critical for us because if an issue comes up and we know this particular senator, for example, has a hold on a piece of legislation, we want to have our local people be able to get that meeting, get in there, talk to him or her, and, um, you know, have that personal contact. We can't stress how important that is. The document also goes into writing campaigns, both letter writing, and again, if you write a letter, send it to the district office or the state office. And we have a couple of examples in there. One, in support of a particular piece of legislation, you know, HR 123. Uh, another sample letter in there if it's an issue, such as health care. And you know, it's always good, even with the sample emails that we send out to you, if you have a personal experience, add that to the email. The emails are, uh, you can edit them, you can add your personal experience. And the same with, with a letter. Put in your own personal experience. Um, you know, if, if you're the spouse of a disabled veteran and you're writing, you might want to mention, you know, what it's like to be that individual's caregiver or what it's like to, you know, rely on that individual's disability compensation as sole means of income. So, the sample of letters there, there's also sample emails, again, the same thing. Um, if you have a personal experience, include it. Social media, I feel a little uncomfortable talking about this issue. I just kind of scratched the surface of what social media is. But uh, there's more information uh, that was put together by our communications department in the document talking about social media. You know, in 2013, 93% of Congress were, were on um, Twitter. You know, they, they pay attention to it. National Journal put together a, a, a book on social media and the importance of social media. And they talked to a number of uh, chief of staff or members of Congress who say, and they monitor Twitter all the time to see what, what the public is thinking. So, you know, again, if you know how to use it, do it if you don't. Try to find a, a young vet in, in your community who's willing to, you know, help. And not even our uh, our young, oh, not only our young vets. We have our interim legislative committee chair Al LaBelle and a number of others like Jim Procuner from Virginia have been, been doing an excellent job on that. So they've educated themselves on it. Now they're doing it regularly, and we're hoping at the end we'll have a chance to hear from them as well um, about what's really been successful and about them, how they went about it, how they just educated themselves. Can, can I make a couple of comments? On no. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, sure. No, if you don't mind. Sure. Because uh, I, I, I talked to you, I gave you a call. My name's Al Bell. I am on the uh, National Legislative Interim Committee. I talked to Joy a while back, and one of the problems, or one of the reasons we put this together is the message is not getting out to the people at the local chapel level. You know, I have gone around to uh, district meetings, chapter meetings, uh, and people, uh, members need to get their information from us, not talk radio, not cable news, not from their next door neighbors, brother-in-law, whatever, they need to get it from us. So one of the things as far regarding social media, and I owe Jim uh, credit for educating me, is that we would like to consolidate uh, Many departments now have Facebook pages, they have uh, Twitter accounts, and what we would love to do is consolidate, get a list of every department's Facebook page and Twitter account. So if you want to, after the meeting, feel free to come up to me and give me the information on it. Uh, and when there isn't a legislative alert, whatever, we can tag the Facebook page, we can notify the Twitter account uh, that this needs to get out to the membership. It's just another way of getting our message down to the grassroots as quick as we can. Uh, let me give you one other phone number here. For If you don't get it to me after the meeting, you can call, the gentleman's name is James Killen with the Communication Department, and I'm going to be meeting with him tomorrow afternoon to discuss consolidating this. His phone number is 859-442-2036. Once again, 859-442-2036. So, again, uh, it's another way of trying to get the message out. Somebody talked about social media earlier. It's a pebble in the pond. The waves go out. And it's just another uh, avenue for us. Uh, one final comment from me, I swear to God. Before we cut uh, this mic off. <laughs> one of the things, I've given so many of these presentations about the benefit protection team. The easiest way to get the information out on this is uh, DAV.org, and Joy talked about it earlier, CAN, C-A-N, DAV.org slant C-A-N. Second way is DAV.org slant grassroots. That will take you to the toolkit, whatever. And the third one is, so you get the proper information, is DAV.org slant setting the record straight. And that's all one word. So just go to those links and you'll uh, get all the information you need on the Benefit Protection Team. Thank you for allowing me to speak here. Thank, Thank you, Al. Al. Thanks, Al. Did, did some, some sign, sign, up, um, sign up sheets, sign in sheets came around. If you have one that where it ended up, could you hold it up in the air and um, Paul or someone from my staff will come grab it or pass it his way? So we want to make sure we get those. Yes, sir. Yeah, for communication purposes, uh, Greg Morris from uh, Chapter 35 of Sarah Line, Alabama. Communi for communication purposes and trying to get us involved with the internet and everything. Uh, the registration information that you're getting from us, for those of us who do have email addresses, how is the national using that information? Well, if you're, if you're signed up for DAV CAN, then you're getting that information pushed out to you. Um, if you're um, a benefit protection team leader for your chapter, hopefully your uh, department benefit protection team leader will get it out to you. But the easiest way to make sure you get the information is sign up for DAV CAN. And your, the benefits protection team leaders that were appointed at the department level are going to be receiving after convention. You'll receive your packet. It'll be a hard copy of the toolkit, a um, 
a, a pin, a couple of pins both for your members and for the leader and some other items. And Mark also wanted to include in there, I believe, a copy that we all got in our backpacks for a convention, which is the Life Memorial document. Um, I'm thinking we're probably going to send a couple of those to you, and that will be a great entree, being able to um, go and talk with your members of Congress and as a gift, sort of letting them know about the memorial and about DAV uh, for those of you who haven't um, made contact yet. Yes. Um, one of the things that when I signed up at Midwinter for the camp is, um, is it fillable? So can you, I, I had a hard time being able to uh, look for them with like fill in the blanks uh, to personalize this. Uh, is it fillable now? Should be. Okay. 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 Yeah, I'll double check on it, Connie. Again, it, once you get these alerts, retweet them. You know, calls to action, put them out there. Make sure that you post them on Facebook, as was mentioned earlier, or LinkedIn if you're on LinkedIn. If you're a blogger, same thing. Post these alerts on your blog. Make sure that you know we keep getting this word out to a large group of people. We talked about social media, now let's talk about the media. So they're an important element also. And you can do letters to the editor. And we have samples uh, of letters to the editor um, in, the, um, in the packet. Also, the communications staff Legislative staff can help you craft a letter to the editor um, on the particular issue, so reach out to them. And there were various blogs, as Al mentioned, under Setting the Record Straight or our DAV um, um, you know, campaign for this year. We've done a number of op-eds um, or blogs under the, um, under the, setting, the se setting the Record Straight campaign that you can use, you know, because these are the discussions that are coming up about the VA health care system. And those were all done by Gary Augustine, and they're up there for you. Again, you can forward them to people. It'll help educate them on the issue about the discussion on the VA health care system. Another avenue is op-eds. A little different than the letter to the editor. Um, there are sample uh, letters in there on doing an op-ed, and again, Use the communication staff, the legislative staff, to help you craft those letters on, on the issues that are important. We talked briefly about coalitions earlier. Yes? What is an op-ed? Op-ed is just talking about a particular issue. Um, what is op-ed? It's, um, op yes. It, and it's sent into the newspaper and they'll print it. Opposite editorial, Joe. Opposite editorial. You got that? It's just it's just where you're stating your position. It's different than the letter. It's a little different than the letter to the editor, um, but it's basically similar concept. Except you're stating a position, and you can't always get them printed in in the media. In some cases you do. Letter to the editor, you might have a, a little bit more success with. But again. Communication staff and, and the legislative staff um, are there to help you put it together. Coalitions, as we mentioned earlier, you know, in many cases, DAV is already a member of a veterans coalition uh, on a local level. Use them, um, you know, get the word out, and a lot of times, you know, uh, members of other organizations are also disabled vets, may be active in some other organization. Um, may not know what the issues are that are going on that are affecting them. So it's good to use those coalitions both to, you know, uh, strengthen your voice and also, again, you know, getting the word out. Um, if you belong to other civic organizations, you know, the Elks, the Lions, uh, Knights of Columbus, get the word out when you attend those meetings. Let them know what's going on. Again, you know, there may be members of those organizations that are also Disabled vets. Midwinter. 
As the benefit protection team leader, I hope that you'll be able to help to coordinate meetings in Washington, D.C. for your delegation that's coming in, and I hope you know, your departments will bring you in um, to midwinter to meet with members of Congress. It's, it's extremely important that you know, we use that time when we're in Washington to make sure that our members hear, I mean, that the members of Congress hear from us. Again, make sure you schedule the meetings before you leave um, your state. It's a lot easier to do it that way. And then coordinate with other members of your department that are coming. You know, something we've tried to do and haven't been very successful in getting the word out is during midwinter, you have a lot of members that can't come into Washington, but they can take that same time and contact their members of Congress, local office, or even the D.C. office, again, to get the word out. And you know, with our members in D.C. going in and meeting with elected officials, as well as uh, generating calls or personal visits into the local office, that word starts to magnify and, and members start paying more attention. So if you have members that are staying back, they can't come to midwinter, make sure that they um, are doing something back home to get the word out. Again, we have sample uh, letters on uh, meeting requests that um, you can use as an example of how to schedule that meeting. An area that we really haven't used very effectively is called grass tops. And those are individuals that have personal contact with a member of Congress or key staff. And again, it could be neighbor of yours or, or you know, a neighbor of the member of Congress that you know. Could be a family member. Uh, your uh, you know, sibling could be married to a member of Congress. Or um, could be a friend, someone you know that also knows a member of Congress. Campaign workers, and we've got a lot of them now out there working on various campaigns. You may know one of those individuals. They could become grass tops for us. Classmate, a member of Congress uh, that you know. Golfing buddy, someone who play golf with a member of Congress when they're, when they're back in town. Could be your commander or your adjutant. You know, a lot of times, DAV commanders and adjutants know their elected officials, and the elected officials know them. Sometimes they're able to pick up the phone and make a personal call. Use that. And if you're a good benefit protection team leader, that grass top could be you. You know, um, being able to pick up a phone and, and call that um, member of Congress. Talk to them. Make it personal. <coughs> grass tops are an important element because again, there's usually that personal contact that that grass top has with the member of Congress. Identify your grass tops, and we have a survey that's part of this packet that hopefully we'll be sending out um, to our DAV CAN to try to identify individuals who may have that personal contact. Um, will also be finding out, and you need to find out, what they're comfortable with. You know, are they comfortable with making personal contact? You know, going into the office and talking to the member. Picking up the phone and calling that member. Or are they more comfortable with just sending an email? And then again, what subject matter are they comfortable with? Are they comfortable talking about health care or maybe just benefits? Um, so these are all areas that will try to identify and that you should be identifying so that you know who to go to and when to go to them. And it's important when you're dealing with grass tops, use them sparingly. You don't want to use them to contact a member of Congress to you know, co-sponsor a COLA bill. I mean, COLA bills are going to get passed. There's no way Congress is going to let COLA legislation not pass. So you know, that's a waste of a good resource. But when you're dealing with Veterans First Act, 
you know, that would be a time when you want to activate that grass top and get them involved in reaching out to that senator or member of Congress um, to uh, let them know that this legislation is important to us. MSOs. Why do we have MSOs up here as part of this? Well, you know, if you've come to midwinter, and even if you've listened to some of the, the talks that have gone on um, here at, at the convention, we talk about what we do. You know, we always put in the commander's statement at midwinter, all the things that DAV NSOs do, how many clients they see, how much money they generated, how many volunteer hours um, our volunteers spend helping other disabled veterans, how many vans we donate. And the reason we do that is because it's important for members of Congress to understand that uh, we're doing something. You know, we're not just asking for benefits or services. We're out there doing something. And the MSO is a great example of that. And, you know, you get the schedule where you can go online and see when our MSO is going to be in your area. Reach out to your elected official. Let them know when that MSO is going to be there and when or uh, where it's going to be. Encourage, if the member of Congress is back or their staff is there, encourage them to come out and see what we're doing with our MSO. Or encourage them, you know, they usually have problems uh, with veteran constituents who are dealing with VA. It's a good opportunity for you to offer those services. Let them know it's going to be an MSO here. If you have any constituents that are having problems, this is the place to send them. Um, if you, they can come down and tour it, again, you know, they're going to have a captured audience of veterans there. Um, you may be able to get members of Congress down there. They see what we do and how we do it, and it has an impact. The next time Joy or her staff go in and see them, they remember, DAV, you know, they're out there helping my constituents. And that's what we try to, to let them know when we do the commander statement, when you hear some of the uh, speeches that are given. We talk about all the things we do because it's important. Nonpartisan, again, that closes out this document and it's important that we remain nonpartisan in everything we do. Now we can disagree with members and, and what they're doing, but <clears throat> we can't pose or support any individual member running for office. And you've got to be careful. We can oppose what they're doing, or we can support what they're doing, but we can't oppose or support their candidacy for public office. We have to be extremely careful, because not only does our congressional charter prevent us from being uh, partisan, but our Constitution and bylaws and our IRS um, code that we're up under for uh, being a nonprofit all prevent us from partisan politics. So be very careful. Again, your individuals, your citizens, you've earned the right to petition Congress as an individual. Do it. We encourage you to do it. But again, be careful that it's not construed as being done in the name of the DAV.